this past week. So much took to get set up and administered and put away. Thank you to all who donated to it. Thank you to all who were able to be able to come and purchase from it too. All of that helps. We had $4,100 that was raised by that sale. All of that goes into mission and ministry work that the LWML and the Ironworks men groups will be working together with funding that way to bless and help people in the name of Jesus. So thank you to all who were able to help with that. And if you're going like this today, we understand why all the lifting and stuff had to be done. So, well, let's go ahead and begin then our worship of today. Today is Trinity Sunday. We remember that the triune God is the true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we're able to rejoice in that knowledge God's given to us in his Bible and that faith he's given us to share as the world needs now, just as much as it ever has. Let's begin in the name of that God that we are here to praise, the living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, my honey, come on up and let's worship our Lord starting off today with a song called Breathe. Anybody who's felt that sense of, okay, summer's here and all of a sudden it's going to go crazy, everything going on, or you just come off of a really busy week to the Breathe song reminds us, take that time, set aside from the busy life. And I'll let that Holy Spirit influence through his word and prayer time and being able to have that one-on-one -on -one with God to be a big part of how we go day to day, week to week. So let's sing, breathe. Got to breathe in the mm, song, too. You ready? <laughs> mm. Alarm clock screaming, bare feet hit the floor It's off to the races, everybody out the door I'm feeling like I'm falling behind, it's a crazy life Ninety miles an hour, going fast as I can Trying to push a little harder, trying to get the upper hand So much to do in so little time, it's a crazy life Race that go, it's another wild day When the stress is on the rise In my heart I feel you say Just breathe, just breathe Come and rest at my feet And be, just be Chaos calls, but all you is to just breathe. <laughs> Third cup of joe just to get me through the day. Wanna make the most of time, but I feel it slip away. I wonder if there's something more to this crazy life. I'm busy, 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 and it's no surprise to see that I only have time for me, me, me. There's gotta be something more to this crazy life I'm hanging on tight to another wild day When it starts to fall apart in my heart I hear you say Just breathe, just breathe Come and rest at my feet And be Chaos calls, but all you really need is to take it in and fill your lungs. The peace of God that overcomes just breathe. Let your weary spirit rest. Lay down what's good and find what's best. Just breathe. Just breathe, just breathe. 
Slow it down a little bit so we can not only catch our breath, literally, but also be able to praise God with a beautiful long time song, Holy, 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 on Trinity Sunday. So perfect to be able to praise the Lord together with the saints gone before us and the angels in heaven and us together in the earth that are blessed to know the Lord is our God and we are His people, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So let's stand and sing together in Holy, Holy, Holy. Was it? Whoops. Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're blessed to know God. It's scary because when you know God, you also realize He's perfect and that we are not. In fact, we're far from it. We all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory and need the forgiveness of Jesus. So why don't we boldly in His name ask for that together again today as we pray together the prayer for renewal. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, as we remember today your perfect unity and teamwork for the good of all, we confess our sinful contrast. We have often worked against your ways in our daily thoughts and words and deeds and have failed to actively pursue your purposes for our lives. We have brought disharmony, heartache, and strife into our relationships with others. We specifically confess to you these things we are aware of that we have done wrong or have failed to do right. Let's continue then together. Thanks and praise to you, dear Lord, for combining the efforts of each person of the Trinity to bring forgiveness, salvation, and your help for our lives daily here on earth. Forgive us our sins. 
Help us to walk in your ways, to have attitudes, words, and actions that are fitting in your holy people. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. We do remember today that God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all as God are interested in and invested in directly in you and me, having that forgiveness for our sins. Jesus being willing to come and be the sacrificial lamb to pay for our sins on the cross. God the Father being willing to have his son come and accepting his payment on our behalf. He didn't have to, but he chose to. The Holy Spirit being the one that creates that faith in our hearts through God's word, brings us alive to be Jesus' people, continues to feed our souls and keep us strong and guide us and help us. How do I live this Christian life? God says it's all important to me. God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit cares about each one of you and me and everyone. He says, he's the one who says, I have forgiven your sins. Trust me, keep with me, and let's go together. So we praise God for his mercy that we are his people by his choice and able to rejoice in that lifelong growing in him together. So let's have a seat then as his forgiven people and loved by him. Let's look at his word for today that we have one of the many places in the Bible that talks about the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This is from Acts chapter 2 this morning, beginning with verse 22. It's on page 1693 in the Pew Bible, 1693, Acts 2, verses 22 through 36. This is still where Apostle Peter is talking here at Pentecost Day and talking about this fulfillment of the Holy Spirit being poured out, New Testament era begun, Christ being the promised Savior, and how that affects our life and our hearts. So chapter 2, verse 22 and following of Acts. Peter says, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke to the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So we see there at work all three of the persons of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being testified to. God carrying out his plan to be able to give us forgiveness and therefore life and salvation with him and each other forever. And we have good reason to say, thank you, God, Father. Thank you, God, Son. Thank you, God, Holy Spirit. Praise be to you, the tri you and God together. All right, we're going to sing one of our old classics. This goes back a few years, and if you've been here for a while now, you say, I remember that. If you're a little newer here, you're saying, I've never heard that before. That's okay. It's a great song. It's one called Because We Believe, and it's basically kind of a, a 
song version of the creed where we say, I believe in what God has spoken his word about who God is. And so this is a chance for us to be able to say, yep, we have that faith together and to sing of that. So again, if you remember this one and know it already, maybe you've heard it before, then uh, do sing it nice and loud. And if it's something that's a little bit new to you, that's okay. And as you get comfortable with it, jump in and we'll praise God then with this song, Because We Believe.
We believe in God the Father. We believe in Christ the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We are the church and we stand as one. Declare it. Say it again. Come on. We are the church and we stand as one. Holy, holy, holy is our God. We have a chance to bear witness that again, that we know that God is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're thankful He's revealed that to us. It's complicated. It's one of those things that our brains can kind of blow up if we try to figure it all out at some point. We simply say, Lord, I trust you. You have told us who you are. We're thankful that you revealed yourself to us. Help us to take that to heart. Help us to share that with the world around us that needs it now just as much as ever. Well, think about that a little bit about sharing Christ with the world around us. That's very different from what we are. As we've seen reading this past week from the story, had a chance to keep going to chapter 29 and start on chapter 30. As we see Apostle Paul has God's calling him to faith in Jesus and then sending him to be a missionary to the Gentile people, the people that didn't know anything about God. They didn't have the Old Testament like the Jewish people did to build on. They were starting from scratch. It's a very different grouping to try to bring the Word of God to. It was a scary thought for a lot of people. How do we even, how do we even talk to people who don't know anything about the God of the Bible at all? How do we share Jesus with somebody who thinks, Jesus, who's that? And it's something that we struggle with too. We, we are living in times where it seems there's more and more people who, what the Bible calls the Gentiles, the non-Jewish background people, that people that in our times that are non-Christian or non-Bible-based people, people who don't know anything about the Bible or who do and push it away and reject it and say it's, it's not true, it's not what I want at all. That's hard, hard for us who are used to living in a country that has had where the majority of people accepted the Bible as the truth and knew at least some of it, even if they didn't follow it all that closely, at least understood it and you could have a conversation. That now it's become where so many people don't know anything about the Bible and we see that kind of this wild lifestyle being held forward more and more in the front front uh, view of people and things going on in our society around us that makes us think, how do we do this? How do we relate to these folks in these times that we live in? I think if you think even just one week to the next anymore, you can kind of find, can't you, something that's going on that is just like, wow, how do we get to that point? This past week, a lot of people have been talking about this group that's supposed to be performing in front of the thousands and thousands of crowds at the L.A. Dodgers baseball game, that group called the Sisters of the Perpetual Indulgence. Have you seen anything about that? It's a group of LGBTQ people that are not only pushing for their cause, but they're also now they're having demonstrations of like Jesus being hung on the cross and then people being pole dancers doing sexual kind of weird, sick stuff to Jesus while he's on this cross. And they, they've taken the Bible verse, the go and sin no more, that was Jesus as he appeared to people, talked to people, healed them, cared for them, loved them, cast demons out of them. He said, now that you've been with me, go and sin no more. Walk the path of following Christ, not the path of the sinful world around us. They take that Bible passage and twist it just a little. And one of their themes for their group is go and sin some more. In other words, do celebrate sin. Do celebrate doing things opposite of what the Bible, Jesus, God, faithfulness says to do. And it's hard enough to hear that from anybody, isn't it? We expect it as part of the sinful world we live in. But what's really making this one, this seems so extra strange, is that it's being foisted upon the whole nation of people watching that ball game in any way they can. And then people saying, you cannot take these guys out of this public show because it's their right to do and say what they want. Even though it runs in the face of how many millions of us who are Christians is just punching our faith in the nose. And we look at it and say, how, how have we sunk to that place? And yet it won't be long, will it? There'll be some other crazy thing that'll be done that's even wilder than that. And really, when you go back and look at history, you know, the, the time that 
We got the radio on accidentally. We're getting music a little bit accidentally. Okay, thanks. But you look back in history, really, we think this is just so extreme. How could anybody ever do this? But you look back at what was going on at the time when Paul was bringing the gospel to the Gentile, believing non, non-Luther or non-Israel background people. And the Gentiles were the ones that were running Rome. The Gentiles were the ones that said, there is no truth. Believe and do whatever you want. Sound familiar for now? The Gentile grouping was the ones that said, you know what, you Christians, you're a pain in the tush. We need to get rid of you, and I think we've got a neat way to do that. We're going to take you and your families, and we're going to put you in the middle of the Colosseum, and we're going to take animals that are starved, hungry, and we're going to let them loose while 10,000 people gathered around are watching and cheering while those animals rip you and your family to shreds. Now, I'm so glad that we haven't gotten to where we're seeing that happening in our country it may, for all the craziness that way that sinful nature draws people away from God and hurts people in the name of freedom more and more. But life has always been hard, really, for Christian people. Walking in this world, when you have people around who do not share that faith, who do not have that conviction and help of the Holy Spirit, who are going to be drawn toward the sinful nature and towards the leanings that Satan's going to want to see people go. So it's something that... This is old stuff, you know, 2,000 years ago that Paul was dealing with bringing Christ to Gentiles and not getting a good reception from some, others coming to faith and being saved. Come to our times right now, it's going to look a lot like this probably more as time goes on. We're we're in an increasingly non-Christian setting that we live in, and Christians are a small minority compared to what most of us growing up, we can remember the times when Christians were a majority and those values then were held to and hold forth in our society by a general basis for people. So let's look at some of the things that God addresses here in his word that helps us today that the same struggles that Paul faced in bringing the gospel to the Gentile people, the ones that didn't know the background of God and his plan at all, and remember how these things will help us in the times that we live in to stand strong in Jesus to be able to share Jesus with the Gentile people, the ones that don't know about the Bible and don't have that shared faith with us because they need it just as much today as people have always throughout time. If you look with me back, if you got your story with you, we're looking at chapter 29, the second part of it still here. And we're on page 432, if you can grab that with me real quick. One of the things that God did through Paul was to write the epistle, the letter to the Roman church. The people that were in Rome, the center city of the Roman Empire, where everything was going on, crazy, wild behavior, there were still Christians there, and they had to deal with, how do I live in this tough time? How do I share the Word of God with people about how does Jesus bring a person to faith and bring them to salvation? So God takes very explicit time and effort here through Paul to bring those things out to bear clearly, and to help us today in our times, everybody that comes into contact with God's Word and hears and learns these things, the Holy Spirit teaches us what is the actual Christian faith, what is that which we hold on to and cherish. So about two-thirds down on page 432, we're going to read the section there. It says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. One of the things that the people in this time period struggle with, and we do still in our times too, is a sense of how am I going to be saved? Well, I'm not as raucousy as those people over there. I'm better behaved than those people over there. I do nicer things than those people there. I go to church a lot more than those people do. I study my Bible at home. They don't. And we're so used to, in our culture, the way we are with Facebook and things now, we're used to comparing ourselves to everybody else. And it's easy to fall into that trap of saying, well, I'm a good person. I try to do what's right. I love God. And I'm going to be okay when I stand before the throne of God in Judgment Day because... I'm at least a lot better than all those other people over there. It's so easy to get drawn into that and to start stacking up our list of our reasons we've earned our way into heaven, at least partly. And God goes through and says, 
every time you look and see somebody else say, they're sinning, they're doing something wrong. How could they do that? You know, it's very easy to get righteously angered towards other people's sin, isn't it? God says, whenever you hold up that law and say, this is wrong, this is not what you're supposed to do, God says that also holds it up to you and to me to say, oh yeah, that includes me too. We may not be doing all kind of crazy, lewd behavior and stuff, but we may have those thoughts of judging other people. We may have those words that are mean and cutting and hurtful towards people. We may not love people and want to help them the way we should. We're all, every one of us is a sinner before God and facing the judgment of his wrath for that sin. And it should make us gulp. If it's up to you and to me to earn our way into heaven, we're in trouble. Because God says the only way you can do that is to be perfect. Just do that and you'll have your way into heaven earned. Good job. Yeah, that's not happening, is it? Because none of us can even begin to be perfect. Only Jesus could do that. And so that's one of the reasons that God gives us his word. And he says, you're in trouble. You need a savior. People who don't believe they need a savior don't care about Jesus Christ. It's like, yeah, I'll talk with whoever God's up there and I'll be fine. I'm, I'm sure they'll be glad. Take me and I try to do what's right. That's a false comfort. It's not reality. Reality is we all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory and need Christ. That's why sometimes they call this the Roman road. That the book of Romans that God wrote, the epistle or letter to the Roman church through Paul had a bunch of the Bible passages that help us know the law and the gospel and how they work together. That's one of those ones that makes us realize I need God's forgiveness because I am sinful and I am not going to make it to heaven by myself. Then he goes on, he says, but now apart from the law of righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are all justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. There's the gospel. From Christ, from start to finish, that's where our hope is. Not Jesus plus me. Not me and Jesus don't need to be here. But Jesus Christ pointed to Him His payment for my sin, Him sending the Holy Spirit that brings me to faith and gives me that trust in the Lord that's so important. So we praise and thank Him for that gift and know that He wants that for everybody. For those of us who are trying our best and have been a Christian a long time, He wants that for us. For people who are wild and crazy and sinful, He loves them too. wants them to repent and realize their sin, trust in Jesus, and come to the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and grow in what that means in life. For that for us as well, God says, I want you to be not just saying, I'm a Christian, I'm good, and live your life as if it's no different than the pagan nations around us or people around us, but to let that difference in Christ soak in. If you look with me over at page 436, the top there, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Be able to know that God has given to us the grace of not only being saved, but also being able to start to understand what does it mean to be God's people? How does this work day to day? This is my worship of the Lord, not just being here on a Sunday morning, but also out there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday afternoon. But how do we treat other people? How do we think? How do our words impact them? And these are all good things God wants for us. He says that we are his holy family. And that as such, it puts us in a wonderful place, And a hard place. You look up at the top of page 435. It says, Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again, but rather the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. By Him we cry, Abba, Father. 
The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. To be able to be God's family is what he has given to you and to me, the privilege of having that status. We're going to live with the Lord in heaven forever when our work on earth is done. Jesus Christ is our brother, co-heir. Think about that. We inherit God's house to live in heaven with him and be our place forevermore. Man, that's privilege. You know, these times that we live in to say, I'm a person of privilege, is like, oh, no, shh, don't, don't say that. That word is always looked as a terrible thing. You're somebody with privilege. You're somebody who should be ashamed that you have advantages somebody else doesn't have. And because of you and I being in Christ, we are privileged people. No way of getting around that. That's a gift. It's a mighty gift of being God's forgiven and dearly loved people. He's given to us. And not everybody has that. And there will be people in our times, just as there was here, who don't like that you're part of God's royal family. You've been adopted into his holy family. They don't like that you're different from the sinful world that enjoys sin and looks forward to how grungy a person can be, but rather has peace, has joy, is able to forgive people when they do something terrible, able to love people when they're not very lovable, able to seek to do what is right and good, not because you're just going to get away with something sneaking around underneath, but because it's who you are in the Lord. We seek to do the best we can day to day, to love people concretely with our words and our deeds, all in the name of it by the power of Jesus. A lot of people, they see it, they notice it, they hate it. How can you do that? How do you have that strength? And they'll resent us, just like people kind of feel that way about the royal family. You think about how many people are so obsessed with the following the... Um, royalty people over in England and what do they eat today what do they wear today where do they go today what do they buy today and on and on and on they'll go and, and they'll put it up on a pedestal oh I wish I could be like them but they'll also look for ways they can then say eh they're not so great put them on a pedestal so they can knock them down people will do that to you and to me as Christians too we have to be aware of that did to Paul a lot of them said I don't like who he is I don't like the strength and joy he has in the Lord I want to take him on and try to knock him down because of it. And when we read here, we see that over and over again. He goes in and shares Jesus, and some people come to faith and are saved. Praise God for that. Others are upset. They push him away. They start up rioting mobs against him, beat him within an inch of his life several different times, try to get him arrested. But he keeps going. And God says, I'll sustain you. Don't give up, Paul. The work you are doing is important and needed. Look at you and me and our times we live in. There's times we feel like, oh, I'm so tired of this world. I just want to go home. I'm tired of how hard it is to live here. I'm tired of dealing with people. They drive me nuts sometimes. Ever feel that way? Easy to get that way, isn't it? God says to you and to me the same thing. He says, don't give up. Hang in there. What you're doing is important. I am with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. We want to remember that. We are privileged people here that have eternal life to look forward to when we're done on earth. It changes how life goes day to day for us. We have the power of God indwelling in us. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit loves us, sets aside as his own. Man, that's, that's amazing stuff. But remember, God also says, Luke 12, 48, he says, to whom much has been given, much will be required. Ooh, that's the other side that we don't always like, is it? That when sometimes somebody has extra strengths, extra skills, extra abilities, they're able to do things to help people in ways that others could not. That's true for you and me. To be a Christian means we are blessed by God with strengths, resources, abilities. Everything we have, everything we are, everything we can do is all God's gift he's given to us. And God says, take this I've given to you. Use it not only to live, but to also be a blessing in Jesus' name to others. So we thank him for the privilege he's given to us to be his own. We ask him to help us to be patient and persistent in Christ's faith in the reality of the truth, even when the world says, no, the Bible's not true, it's just a bunch of fairy tales, you know better because the Holy Spirit has taught you. And it's a gift God's given to us. And we are blessed then to be able to share Christ and his word while we can, while we're here with the people in our lives and pray that he'll help us to be those who rejoice in that 
extra requirement he's placed upon our shoulders because he's given to us the blessing of eternal life and faith in him. So read the next week if you can, the rest of that chapter 30 about Paul's continued work. And then the last chapter of the reading of the story will already be upon us. And that will be looking at Revelation and the end times. Let's go ahead and let's stand and let's come to our Lord in prayer together. Is it warm in here to anybody else besides me? Okay. I wonder just real quick if we could get that checked because the system, I wonder if it's turned off. It says 75. I didn't wonder if it was just me having a hot flash or if it was. Let's see. Yeah, it's saying it's not on right now. So give me just a second, if you will, folks, and let's get that. We can turn the air back on again. Don't want us all roasting in here for sure. Too late. I understand. Okay, there's a little bit of cool. And Victor, do you remember how to turn the, the things up and down? If you wouldn't mind, see if that, that side may have gotten it. This seems like it's really warm in here to me. John said it's on. I got this one on. You got that one? Okay. Okay. We, Victor, we, she got it up top then. Okay. Thank you. Good. All right. Go like this. Breathe up from up there for a few minutes, and we'll be good then. Okay. Let's come to our Lord in prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing you've given to us of being your holy family, royal priesthood, holy nation, things that you have given to us as your gift from start to finish, the faith, the forgiveness, the life, the salvation, the calling to be able to let people in this world that we live in today know of you. We know they need it just as much now as people have ever in the first century and will be in the last century and will be every time in between. Strengthen our faith in you. Help us to be at peace. Help us to have that clear difference in life in you from the world around us that does not know you. And to look and to see the people in our life and times that are hurting without Christ yet and to love them and to share you with them, knowing that we can't make anybody come to faith. Only your spirit will do that. But sharing that word and that love that you've given to us to pass on to others. Thank you for people like Paul and those who went before us who have able to powerfully done this and faithfulness to you and how you've worked through them to bring others, some of our probably long back relatives to faith so that we are knowing Jesus as our God and our Savior in times that we live in. We pray for your healing and your help for those who are facing hardships and struggles in this life and all the forms that they come. We do some specific prayers in Jesus' name today. Also, we pray for your continued healing and health for Earl Landman and Jerry Lewis in dealing with their cancer. We pray to be with Jean Crossed as she has been diagnosed now with a cancer slump in her lung. Help her and the doctors and how things should be dealt with this and grant we pray the healing as is needed. We thank you that you've kept watch over Chuck Burke. And he's been able to be back with us at church today after being in the hospital with a heart surgery for recovery for several weeks. Continue to heal Chuck, we pray. Thank you for the rummage sale opportunities to work together to serve you and help people in Jesus' name this past week. Take those funds that were raised, we pray, Lord, and put them to the things you know are most needed and most beneficial to your work in this time and place that we live. Help us as a church family to continue to find ways to be able to serve you by serving people in your name, not only caring for each other and encouraging God in faith, but also in reaching out to the community in Jesus' name and having a chance to share you with some who right now do not know and trust in you as their Lord. We pray that you be with Mark Cave's father, John T., as he's having trouble with an infected leg and is in the hospital again. We pray then these things and all is in our hearts today. In the name of Jesus, he has taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. 
Amen. We'll celebrate the Lord's Supper again today as one of the ways that God very specifically tells us, I died on the cross and rose again for you, that you may be my forgiven and dearly loved child, headed for heaven together with us. We remember then that our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said to them, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same way also, Jesus took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Please have a seat, if you will, then let's celebrate the gifts of God's Supper together. Let me boast this precious body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strength and keep each of you, strong in that faith he's given you, till the day your work on earth is complete, and the Lord says, come home, my child, be together with me and all with me in life everlasting in heaven. Depart then in his peace and that gift he has given you. Amen. Shall we wrap up on Trinity Sunday? It's our tradition long going back to speak portion of the Athanasian Creed. If you grab your bulletins with me here, down at the very bottom right section there inside and onto the back. This is one of what they call the three universal creeds. 
that goes way back to the early centuries of the church, and different churches all over the world have used this, including ours for centuries, as a summary of the Christian faith, all from the Bible directly as this is what God has said about what's the deal. So we, we speak the Apostles' Creed here most every week. There is the Nicene Creed, it's another one that's a little more long and detailed about Jesus specifically as God and man. The Athanasian Creed is one that's actually much longer than what we've got here. We just have a summary section of it. There's a very detailed explanation of the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, three persons, and how to try to kind of state that so that people understand it. It, it gets a little thick, so of course when you go through this, don't be surprised. It's like, what was that again? It'd be great if you want to take this with and just kind of look through it again this week sometime and get reviewed again of what is the triune God that we believe in? What does the Bible say about it? Jesus being human and being God is so important so he could die for our sins as a human, yet overcome sin and death as God. So that's all summarized as our faith that we have been blessed to know from the Lord and his word that we can say this is where I'm at in my faith together again today. So it's a response reading goes on to the back. So whoever will be saved shall, above all else, hold the Christian faith. And the Christian faith is this, that we worship one God in three persons and three persons in one God, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Spirit. Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, and the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. So likewise, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And yet they are not three gods, but one God. For as we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge every person by himself to be both God and Lord, so we cannot by the Christian faith say that there are three gods or three lords, the whole three persons are co-eternal, together and co-equal, so that in all things, as has been said, the unity in Trinity and the Trinity in unity is to be worshipped. He therefore that will be saved is compelled thus to think of the Trinity. Furthermore, it is necessary to everlasting salvation that he also believe faithfully the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the right faith is that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man, God of the substance of the Father, begotten before all worlds, and man of the substance of his mother, born in the world, equal to the Father as touching his Godhood, and inferior to the Father as touching his manhood, who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again the third day from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. This is a Christian faith, which except a man believe faithfully and firmly, he cannot be saved. Well, this is the week the Lord has made. So let us rejoice in it and make it count for him. The Lord then bless and keep each of you. Lord, make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Lord, look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Thank you for being here. God's blessings on the rest of your day and week and hope to see you then next Sunday. eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see 
to see. 